We're happy to be with you for this worship service. And now as we open God's holy word and study what he has for us, I'm sure that you with me will receive a great blessing. You know, as we read the newspapers, isn't it true that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled? My father, H.M.S. Richards, is presenting now the subject, Watch Bible Prophecy. Suppose you'd been reared by an infidel, your father and mother skeptics, and you'd been reading the writings of Tom Paine, Robert Ingersoll, Voltaire, Hume, and other doubters and infidels. Well, this was the case with a very dear friend of mine. As he grew to manhood and continued to study, he began to read the Bible. Against his will, and to his utter amazement and deep chagrin, he found the evidence of the truth of the Bible and the Holy Word itself. And he found it to be overwhelming. In that wonderful book he found these words, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. That's Isaiah 1.18. And as a result, my friend now is a thorough Bible-believing Christian, right at this moment, and he has been for years. Bible prophecy convinced him of the inspiration of the Scriptures. Remember, Bible prophecies are not guesses. Here's the challenge of 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21. Despise not prophesyings. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Some people have the idea that Bible prophecy is merely clumsy guesswork. They take the words of the skeptics and make no honest personal investigation. Why not be reasonable? Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And so let's do it. If the prophecies of the Holy Scripture are straightforward, easy to understand, have been fulfilled accurately in history, then we must accept the Bible as the Word of God. Here are the words of the Lord himself, spoken through the prophet Isaiah. I am God and there is none else, none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times of things that are not yet done. There you have it, God's challenge. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Read the prophecies of the Scriptures, then go to the library and find out the truth or error of these divine predictions. No other book has ever been like this or able to make such a challenge and stand such a test. The Bible has now been translated in full or in part in over a thousand languages, and this challenge comes as never before to everybody in this electronic age. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons. Let them bring them forth, and show us what shall happen. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. Isaiah 41, 21 and onward. This is God's challenge to false gods everywhere. The true God will be known by the historical fulfillment of the prophecies of his holy word. Notice that, historical fulfillment. I tell you before it comes, said Jesus, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. John 13, 19. Jesus based his claim to be the true Messiah, the true Christ of God, on the fulfillment of his own word. Bible prophecies are not like the predictions of the Delphian Oracle in the days of ancient Greece, which were so worded that no matter what happened, they could claim fulfillment. In the Holy Scriptures, there are scores, hundreds of fearless prophecies reaching down, not merely a few days, weeks, or years, but hundreds, yes, thousands of years into the future. The Bible speaks as certainly of the future as historians can speak of the past. In fact, it describes future events before they occurred. Now, let's have a few examples. In Isaiah 13, beginning with the 19th verse, and Jeremiah 51, beginning with verse 24, reference is made to the great kingdom of Babylon, which at the time of the prophecy, notice, was a mighty nation, the most mighty nation. These prophecies came true, and they have remained true during the past 2,000 years or more. No one can deny it. It's a fact. Every day that Babylon remains, now an uninhabited ruin, the challenge of the unbelieving world stands. Listen to the words written way back 700 years before Christ. Babylon shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there. Isaiah 12, 19. Remember, Babylon was probably the greatest city in the world at that time, like London or New York today, apparently an invincible city. It was often called Golden Babylon, the wonder of the world, and so on. Not only was it to be overthrown by its enemies, but it was to sink completely out of sight as a city, no one to live there. This was literally fulfilled and is its condition today, and I know it from personal observation. When Mrs. Richards and I visited the site of Babylon a few years ago, no one lives there now. No Arab even pitches his tent there. Only a guide stays there in the shed during the day. 
to take visitors around and show them the desolation. He doesn't even live in the city himself at night. Babylon was located right in the midst of the fertile delta of the Euphrates River. Why doesn't some unbeliever rebuild Babylon? And Echo answers, why? My friend mentioned earlier in this talk, whom Bible prophecy convinced of the truthfulness of the scriptures, is now so enthusiastic on this subject of Bible prophecy that he's offered a challenge from the public lecture platform for one single instance in which a Bible prophet predicted that a people, city, or nation was to be utterly destroyed, and that people, city, or nation is in existence today. Although his challenge stood for many years, it was never accepted. Nineveh, the Tower of Babel, Assyria, many other nations and places are today in the exact state that Bible prophecy said they would be in. Prophecy said that Babylon would cease to exist. It also said that Egypt would continue to be a nation, but not a ruler of other nations as it was. While Babylonia, Assyria, and other ancient nations have completely disappeared, Egypt has continued from the very earliest times, though not always as a great world power. This was all prophesied in Scripture. You see Ezekiel 29th chapter and the 30th chapter. Why did Egypt not become desolate like Syria? Why did she not pass out of existence like Babylon? Why did she lose her independence and for nearly 3,000 years become a subject nation, ruled over successively by Persians, Greeks, Romans, Byzantine Greeks, Saracens, Turks, French, and British? Now they again have their own ruler. Why? Prophecy answers why. It was foreseen and declared by the holy prophets of the Bible. The city of Sidon, not far from Beirut, in the country now called Republic of Lebanon, is one of the oldest cities in the world. It was about 1,500 years old when Ezekiel the prophet undertook to tell its future. That's the 28th of Ezekiel. He said it would receive terrible punishment for its sins, but made no prediction of permanent destruction. History tells us that no city has been captured more often than Sidon, and it still exists today. I've walked its streets. While it's not a big city nor a mighty ruling power, it's still there, a witness to the fulfillment of prophecy. Why was not the small Jewish nation exterminated from the face of the earth? How could the prophet Moses foresee that its people would be left without a king, country, high priest, or temple, rooted out of their own land, scattered over all the earth, persecuted from country to country, yet still remain a distinct and prosperous people? It's all in the 28th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. No other race of earth has endured one half as much as they have endured through the ages, and yet survived. How did Moses know? It was revealed to him by God. How did the prophet Daniel know that there would be only four great world kingdoms to the very close of time? No one else knew it. In fact, Daniel didn't know it. God revealed it to him. Read it for yourself in the second chapter of his prophecy. At that time, his prophecy was made. It seemed absurd, for in the period between 650 and 150 B.C., only 500 years, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, four great world powers came into being, one after the other, held universal sway. If Daniel had been judging by the past and predicting by analogy, he would have said four universal kingdoms covering 500 years gives an average of a universal kingdom every 125 years. He didn't say that. On the contrary, he declared that there would be only four, and after the fourth, no succeeding world kingdom. This fourth would be divided and remain divided till the end of time. Then history comes along and tells us how the Emperor Charlemagne, Charles V of France, Napoleon, and even the Kaiser tried to reunite these fragments and gain world dominion for Western Europe, but they all failed. How did Daniel know? He didn't know. God revealed it to him. Then in the 44th verse of that same chapter, he speaks of the coming universal kingdom of Christ. But here's another prophecy. Our Savior and the Apostle John declared that near the end of the age, the gospel of Jesus would be preached to every nation on earth and every people. You can read that in Matthew 24, 14 and Revelation 14, 6. Nothing seemed more impossible at the time. 1,800 years passed by. Think of it. 1,800 years. And still the Holy Bible was available in only a few languages. But suddenly everything changed. Today the scriptures are translated in over a 1,000 languages, and 500 million copies have been distributed over the earth. The printing presses of great publishers are humming night and day, producing Christian literature. Thousands of Christian missionaries and workers are scattered over the world. New means of communication have been invented so men can quickly take gospel messages all over the earth. Now comes radio and television to hasten the work. How does it happen that of all the books published in the world, not one has been translated in one-twentieth as many languages as has the Bible? How did Moses and David and Job and all the other Old Testament writers know that a Savior was coming? 
Why did they predict it hundreds of years in advance and fill their writings with prophecies of his birth, his manner of life, his sufferings, his crucifixion, his resurrection, the character of his friends and his enemies? How did they know all this? They didn't. It was revealed to them in divine prophecy. They were merely the writers, the ones who were inspired by God to put down these things before they became facts. Think of that baffling mathematical prophecy fulfilled to the very letter found in Daniel 9th chapter. The prophecy which predicts the appearance of Christ as the Messiah in the very year of his crucifixion is all based upon a decree of the king of Persia which is found in its entirety in Ezra the 7th chapter. The date of this decree was 457 years before Christ. It is proved correct by the canon of Ptolemy and the concurrent testimony of more than 20 eclipses. It's one of the best established dates in history. 69 weeks or 483 prophetic days or literal years beginning in 457 before Christ did reach to the anointing of Christ as the Messiah by the Holy Spirit in AD 27. We have the Bible to prove it, and history sustains this prophecy. It's all found in the first chapter of John, third chapter of Luke, fourth chapter of Luke, and Acts, tenth chapter. The marginal date in your Bible. We'll uh, make that plain there. The middle of the 70th or last week of years of this period brings us to the spring of AD 31, when according to Daniel's prophecy, Messiah would be cut off or killed. And so it occurred in the spring Passover of that year. This proved Jesus of Nazareth to be the Christ, the Son of God, and the only true Messiah that ever came to Israel or ever would come. Why have all the skeptics been unable to disprove these things? Why? Because they're true. History has proved to be his story, God's story, and all the centuries rise up like witnesses to testify that God's word is true and that his holy book is vindicated. Why did God give these prophecies? Why did he see that they were fulfilled? Because, as the apostle tells us in Acts 17, 26, God determined their appointed seasons and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord. The reason for the fulfillment of prophecy is that men should seek God. The fulfillment of Bible prophecy is to the intent that men might repent, be converted, and find spiritual peace and a home in God's heaven at last. For it's written that God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret to his servants, the prophets. Amos 3, 7. This is so that men may believe God's word and turn to him for salvation through Christ. Remember, no prophecy of the scripture ever came by any private, from every private source. It did not come by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We've barely touched this subject, but let me suggest it would be well to stop ignoring the Bible and making fun of it. One had read it become truly educated, and receive that wisdom and understanding that will lead to life eternal through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. He was not only the greatest subject of all the prophets, but was himself the greatest prophet of all. What's the next great and imminent event in the history of the world, according to the Bible prophecy? Read the wonderful book of God and find out. And may God bless you as you do this, yes? Go and inquire. An open Bible for the world May this our glorious motto be On every breeze the truth unfurled Shall scatter blessings rich and free Blessed Word of God Send forth thy light O'er every land and every sea, every sea, till all who wander in the night are led to God and Him by Thee. Be offers rest to weary hearts, it comforts those who sit in tears, to all who faith and strength imparts, and gives with hope eternal years. Blessed word of God, send forth thy light, o'er every land and every sea, every sea, till all who wander in the night are led 
to go. 